Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks again for tuning into uh, Doers Within Emerging Market, Time for Emerging Market. Um, I'm so honored that I have an amazing guest here, uh, David um, Akeninin, that's right. Uh, I hope I pronounced it properly. Uh, David yeah, Akeninin is yeah, it's such an amazing, uh, I just, when I kind of got his profile and uh, looked at his LinkedIn and the amazing work he was doing, I, I felt it was, it was, it was just, uh, I had to bring him on the podcast. So uh, thank you, David, for being here. And I'm honored that you had the time to be here. So please, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so much. Uh, my name is David. Obviously, you have shared that. I'm originally from Venezuela. I'm one Moroccan, my dad's Spanish. I finished high school in the United States. Left the, the horrible situation that Venezuela has been going on for now. Uh, we left in 2003. So a lot has happened. I think more awareness driven to it. And um, yeah, I spent some time working at Google and during my internships, um, during my bachelor's degree at the University of Chicago. Um, I, I speak six languages. I am passionate about the emerging markets, the fusion of uh, technology and finance. I spent a good three years almost of training at Credit Suisse in investment banking out of New York. Um, and then out of South America, out of their Chile office. And then I came out to Namibia in Southern Africa where I have been an entrepreneur for about seven years. Um, if entrepreneurship was the way you looked, I would be muddy full of mud. I have fallen many times in the pantanos. Pantanos are these like muddy, dark sand waters where you can sink all the way through if you don't get out of it. Yeah. But uh, what's nice about mud is that it's all muddy and ugly and soft, but when it hardens, it makes it, it makes everything you're wearing stronger. Definitely. And I think, uh, I think that's, it's, I've been fortunate enough to be muddy enough times where where my shirts are hard and my jeans as well. well thanks so much for sharing that. I, you know, based on your response, it sounds like you've had a diverse range of experiences, you know, you know being in the US and you know, coming from Venezuela. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, a, a very unique in some ways of just having a diverse breadth of different markets. And um, that's truly, truly inspiring. And through this journey, right, can you tell us like, how did you come to where you are in terms of your career, right? How did you end up uh, where you are? I think it would be very interesting for people to know, uh, to know that. Well, I think, I think there's, a, there's a few factors that play a role in, in where you end up. One of them is, is, uh, is luck. If you, if you feel like you're in the right place, otherwise you call it bad luck. So I call it luck. Um, you know, and, and you have to be positive for luck to come at you. So the more positive you are about the decisions and events that happen in your life, the more you attribute them to luck instead of bad luck. And I think, you know, that's always been the case. The second one I would say is when you're a young boy growing up in Venezuela, your world is your community, your classroom, your family, your parents. It's, it's very tight as it is when you are a young boy in Lagos or Enugu in Nigeria, or if you are a young child in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. You know, that's all you know. And that's why oftentimes people say when I am in an, any country, oh, how did a boy from Venezuela end up here? Because they put themselves in the shoes of, you know, I'm a boy from Bintuk, Namibia or a girl from Bintuk, Namibia, and I never went anywhere. What, how did you end up here? Exactly. And I think, you know, in, in retrospect, it looks like a positive story. But when you're going through the story, it's, it's what's happening around the world with globalization, right? Yes, some, exactly. some, some economies are being affected negatively uh, and positively by globalization and it makes people move around the world and they take their kids with them and expose them to new things. In my, in my situation, my brothers and I were kidnapped growing up in Venezuela and um, it, it burst our bubble. You know, if you live in a bubble, this can easily burst it. Yeah. And um, yeah, for my parents, it was difficult. They became immigrants. We left afterwards. We left the country. We moved to the United States. And for them, it was a big struggle to pick up the arms and, and, and start a new country. But also, they did it with such effort. And, and they guided us with the same values and ethics that we would have in our own little bubble. That it, it opened my world, you know. 
Um, yeah. Actually, when I was in high school, I, I was fortunate enough to take a uh, dual enrollment course at a university. Mm -hmm. And my professor was an African man from, the, from Cote d'Ivoire. Wow. Now, wow. here, a Venezuelan boy who no longer lives in Venezuela, but in, the, yeah. in North America, exposed to cultures and immigrants and different language and, and ambitions. And here's an African man teaching me about his continent. So it, yeah. I, this was my first uh, engagement formally with, with the continent. And, uh, and I left that room thinking that's where I want to have my formative years. I want yeah. to graduate and I want to go work there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the third point is guidance. You know, yeah. you have some luck, you have some exposure, and then you have guidance. And sometimes the guidance comes in the form of, of your work. You know, mm -hmm. you learn about finance and you expose yourself to new things, but also mentors. A lot of people have mentored me along the way, and I've been ambitious enough to seek those mentorships. And, and also I've been, I give back to those mentorships. So somebody mm -hmm. who's your mentor wants to have a dual relationship. They're not just giving you advice for free. So exactly. I've been, I've been cognizant that that was going to hopefully take me places. And even today, I mean, I build mentorships and I mentor people just to be able to continue creating that ecosystem that guides you in one direction. So. Definitely, definitely. And that, that is, that's a really powerful uh, story. Um, and just, just to take a segue of that, like who are the mentors that you can tell, like they really helped you, uh, you know, you know, position you to where you're being, um, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you have some, you've had some people that really guided you. And, and also, I think just a leading question, like, how can people find mentors, especially in like ecosystems like yours? The first one is my father, hands down. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people are afraid to say that their parent or their brother is a mentor. And I think that's a big mistake. Like, these are the people who deserve the most credit and the most recognition for guiding you in life. Yes. Surely my mom and my brothers have always been there for me as family members and as mentors in their own in their own extent. But my father is someone I talk to on a daily basis, has no expertise in the fields I work in, but with his values and his ideas and creativity and, and just positive spirit, he's always a phone call away from a from a thought or a decision that I've had to make. And I think you know, it's invaluable if I, if I could, I, I wouldn't have the budget to cover what it would cost to have someone who has that care for you, you know? Yeah. And uh, for all these people who are looking for mentors and you have a good family and you cannot find a mentor, you're missing the point, like they are around you, you know? So that's the first thing, you find your mentors in your family and uh, yes. they might not cover all the bases, but surely they help you get to where you need to be. And they've, they've done it for you until now. Yes. And for those people who, who don't think they have a family and cannot kind of relate, like, oh, I don't have a father or a mother or a brother that could guide me, look harder. You know, there is always someone around you while you've been growing up that has been a guiding force. It can be a police officer in the corner of your street or your neighbor, but there is always someone. More professionally, I would say, notably, there was an alum of my university who, who was instrumental when I first set up on four we i've come to terms with that which means that mentors are not forever some people are uh, guiding a guiding path along the way and some people are lifetime mentors um some friends of mine are mentors you know people who are my age or even younger who've done what i'm about to go do so you know right now i'm in a capital raise process for a startup we have i don't shy away from picking up the phone to a friend or a person i know and saying hey I'm trying to raise money and I don't know how this works. Would you guide me? Exactly. And it is as simple as admitting to yourself and the other person that you need help. Exactly. And with the sincerity of why and for what. <laughs> and I think that's how you get the mentor. It's, it's an informal process. Somebody can mentor you for an hour and somebody can mentor you for a lifetime, like I said earlier. So yeah, I think the best way to find someone to help you is to, to pick up the phone or to send a, a very sincere message. The shorter, the better, so that it doesn't feel like you're beating around the bush. And just say, like, I've noticed you're doing this and I would love to learn more or I would love your help on, on figuring out what I'm about to do. Definitely. Devin, uh, David, I want to be your man. I want you to be my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> no, man. Like, like I said, find something we can have a talk about. And what's really important about mentors, man, it's that, you know, we put in a title almost, I guess, if it's a board member of a company. Like, it's not so formal. It's a relationship building thing. It's a conversation. And, and one of the things I feel people miss and it could have been me at a younger age, but I'm very cognizant of it now. Is 
and somebody is giving back to you, find a way to be, uh, find a way to in re be retroactive, you know, yeah. to give something back. And if, if, if the person is in a certain industry, read up more about it, be in touch with them about it. I learned in college once that a good way to build a mentor was um, look up an article that could be interesting to them and send it. Nice. You know, yeah. This is interesting. It could also be very fake. So don't mm -hmm. just send an article, say, hey, I read about the, you know, you're, you're a hedge fund manager. I heard about the GameStop stock yeah. going up. I, I, I think you'll find this interesting article. They'll probably archive it and not read it. But, um, you know, it's, you have to, it's, it's about, it's like building a friendship. You, you don't apply for somebody to become your friend. You make it happen over time. And I, for me, a mentor is a friend with, with some more um, utility, right? You're exactly. getting some utility. Exactly. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. I think most of our listeners would really appreciate that. Um, it's very practical, very authentic. And it also speaks true to someone like you that is doing some amazing work. Um, can you just, I, I know you just talk about raising money for so can you just share more about, I'm guessing this is Jabo Logistics, right? Yeah. Yeah, please, can you just talk about so the Jabo, company? Go ahead, please. Yeah, 100%. So Jabo is a company we launched uh, last year um, in Namibia. Um, you know, I've been doing construction and home financing for about seven years out in Africa. So for anyone listening in and, and thinking it's all about startups, there's a lot you can do that's not startups. Actually, I don't know anything about raising capital for startups. Uh, I consider myself to be a passionate adventurer on a mission. And um, when we find opportunities to make things happen, we call that entrepreneurship. And apparently when you combine it with technology and there's a need for capital, you call it a tech startup. So that's what we're up to. Um, you know, I've been working in Namibia, in Zambia. I've done some work in Cameroon also some years okay. back. I'm from Cameroon. I love where I am. <laughs> Is it? And, and I've enjoyed it very much. I've, I've moved all around. I've driven, I've driven like four or five hours into one airport to the other. I also lost my luggage at the airport and it was an impossible task, but I got it back a month later. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I'll say this on the record. I've been deported from Cameroon, also, <laughs> which was a crazy, which was a crazy experience. We can, we can discuss that. Uh, at some point or, or another day uh but yeah it's but my life's been it's quite interesting the past almost decade out here um yeah. this is a b2b marketplace for the mm -hmm. informal sector so i mean this concept of b2b is the fact that we are the bridge between two businesses the suppliers and manufacturers of food mm -hmm. and the retailers of that food in the informal sector mm -hmm. about a year and a half ago um to kind of give birth to the story. I mean, if exactly. some of your listeners are trying to understand how businesses come to be, you know, yes. we had a contract to go build um, a, a few things on the NGO level and some yeah. of that funding was going away. And um, we decided to speak to those NGOs about helping them source that food. And we sourced that food for them. They wanted to give it out at the very beginning of the pandemic to impoverished communities that were probably going to be affected. And um, when we did that, we thought, okay, Maybe there is a business here. So we, spent, we, we delivered about 3,600 parcels of food to families around all of Namibia. And there wasn't any business there. The logistics, food, nobody would be able to pay for it if we did it on a sustainable basis instead of giving them away. But what we discovered was that in the informal sector, there are barely any supermarkets. And I'll tell you a little bit about the informal sector because it's an yeah. interesting perspective to understand. I'm sure, sure from a... From a Yaoun, from a Yaounde perspective, you would also see that you know it's kind of like the townships or the suburbs, yeah. uh, the shacks, you know. Yeah, exactly. But um, what we discovered was that, especially in southern Africa, <laughs> you know, and I'm sure this is the case in West and Eastern Africa, you have a lot of townships, a lot of people living informally in places with no water, no electricity, no sewage. And, you know, when I first came to Namibia, this was impactful to me. I, I also grew up in places with bad neighborhoods. And, 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 and I don't mean bad neighborhoods about crime. I mean with access to resources. And when I landed here, my first vision was we need to build housing. You know, in 1990, Namibia became independent. And you have the government done an amazing job at actually providing education and healthcare and police and all of this stuff 
and decentralize it, take it to the regions. But when I went to the regions, I found people making over a thousand US dollars a month working in police stations and nurses and schools and stuff, which is, by the way, a lot more than public servants make in West Africa. But this, and I realized that, you know, there is a huge housing demand. And that's what I've been focused the, the bulk majority of my years here. But more recently, the more I spent time in the informal sector, especially with the beginning of the pandemic, we saw that in these informal sectors, there's no supermarkets in general. You know, if there's no water, no electricity, no sewerage, no roads, why would a big chain supermarket come set up shop? It doesn't exactly. happen. Exactly. So by default, your auntie, your grandma, your, your cousin, your neighbor, all of them decide, let me open a little shop outside my house and let me yeah. sell sugar and maize meal and pasta and Coca-Cola. And some of them say, let me sell beer and let me sell hard liquor. And before you notice it, the entire ecosystem is a business. Exactly. Everyone has a shop. One out of two to three houses in the informal sector is actually selling food today, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And early last year, Q2 last year, we went out there and we digitized. And by digitized, I mean, we geotagged. So we built a, a, a map, we took inventory mm -hmm. um, and we did things you couldn't imagine that we couldn't also at the time to actually understand what was the market like. And we, we mapped out about 3,000 shops in the informal sector of Vinto in, in about a month and a half. Wow, wow, wow. And with that, I picked up my truck, started selling food out of the back of my truck. And fast forward today, we have an app. Um, it's a marketplace where all of the shops can order from and all of the brands can actually directly supply through our marketplace to these shops. And if you wonder why did we come to exist is because all these shops have no one supplying to them. They have no pricing, no bulk buying, no supply chain, no value chain. So they yeah. need to imagine, here's a, here's a story of Joanna. Sure. She wakes up 6 a.m., 5 a.m., gets into a taxi, leaves her kids with the nanny who's charging her per hour until she comes back. Yeah. Goes all the way to the center of the city to a supermarket and buys at retail prices what she can carry in her two hands. Mm -hmm. She then drives back to the informal sector where she lives in that district, maybe three hours of her day have gone by. She puts the products on the shelf and, see, and she sells them at a margin, which usually is gonna be now 20 to 40% more than what it costs in the supermarket. So we're talking about that the bulk majority of the people live in the informal sector and have to pay 20 to 40% more for food that you or I could drive up to and buy in a supermarket. So we've created basically that that marketplace that serves that need and we're putting technology to work in there. And, um, and it's, been, it's been an amazing, we launched the product officially at the end of August, 2020. And it's been an amazing uh, growth. Um, the pains of growth are real. I've been reading a lot of articles about the pains of growth. I mean, we've been growing approximately 30% week over week since we launched. Oh, wow, that's uh, pretty good. Weeks there's weeks where we grew 70%. We were growing a lot less at the beginning because I wasn't mm -hmm. putting working capital and credit lines to it. Yep. So there's weeks where we're launched and we've entered a bunch of new segments. And, and yeah, that, there's a lot of pains to that, but it's very exciting. Yeah. And it brings me to the beginning of when I came here. It's a discovery stage. Yeah, definitely. And I know growing up in an ecosystem like that, I really understand where you're coming from with that informal sector and how that actually is like the engine behind most of the commercial activity. So um, it's yeah. truly, truly brilliant. Um, it's such an amazing work you're doing. And I think um, it, this, it speaks a lot to, I think you're like, just like your vision and, uh, you know, just even how you're talking about the growth, it shows that you're a tenacious person and you can actually you know, move a team to make things happen. So um, I'm really excited for you. <laughs> I think this. Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's exciting. It's overwhelming. And at the same time, it, it gives you that butterfly feeling like you're building something. Yes. Um, I'm also super fortunate. Uh, two of my brothers live out in, in Namibia. Um, they've, they've moved here over the years while I've been here. Um, and it's, it's so great to, to also have family with you. So when you're in a new market and, uh, and you're trying to, to build something, it's so important to have support. Like mental health is, is such an important topic that I don't think we've talked about enough. Um, you know, and I think family in a way is a really good way to keep that in, in, in check, you know, yeah. make sure you have people around you that are supportive and also building a good team. Like 
you know, I'm always trying to learn how to hire better. You know, I've, yeah. I've had some crazy experiences, man. I've hired someone. It took me two months to hire them. They're two days on the job. And then the third day they don't show up. You ask them what happened. They said, oh, I got an offer for another company also. So I just mm-hmm. changed jobs. But it's like, what? And you're telling me now? Like, you know, I, I went two months to recruiting you. So there's a lot of crazy experiences that can happen from a hiring perspective, sourcing, uh, technology building. And just making sure that you treat the business and the people in the business like your own family. Definitely. It's really, really where you can build something to me. Yeah. And just, just to digress a little bit, I think this is very important. Mental health, especially, uh, you know, in a space, in a, in a continent like Africa, right? It's not something that is really, uh, you know, there's not a lot of spotlight on that. Um, I, I know mental health is, I, I think it's becoming more of a pandemic in a sense. Uh, but I know specifically in entrepreneurship is becoming very, very challenging, uh, especially when you're building something of that, of that growth. Can I just, uh, and maybe it can be a little bit personal, like how it's so, it's so important to, to, to take care of your mental health and how you have navigated that. And I think most people will really benefit a lot from your, if you can share a little bit about how you have gone through that. Yeah, look, man, I mean, my first response will be I'm not perfect. So surely I, uh, I have a lot of good positive energy that I try to bring to the table. And uh, I also have some good brothers that can remind me when I'm not doing that. So if I'm highly stressed and they notice it, they'll call me out on it. So I think so, the first one is surrounding yourself by people that, that can be real, that can tell you things when they are not, when they are not the way they're supposed to be. I mean, I'm working 18 hour days sometimes and it takes one of my brothers to knock on my door and say, are you kidding me? Like you're going to burn out, you know, um, or just to remind you, Hey, are you going to come home for dinner? Like, do you want to hang out for dinner? Like, are you, what are you doing at the warehouse still at the distribution center? So I think just don't disconnect from the people that care the most about you. That's honestly been the only reason I've been able to build Jabu to where it is now with that we have, because I think, not only my brothers, but some of the team members at the lowest level, I'm talking about the cleaner of the warehouse to the driver, all kind of are looking out for each other. And when, you know, I've had two moments where, where, how do they say in French, shit hit the fan, Um, you know, and one was a labor dispute, it was like 10 p.m., people were still at the distribution center, cash center, like everyone was overworked and somebody decided to write me an angry email and I had two options. One was ignore, you know, yep. which is like what most entrepreneurs do when, a, when, when you're afraid of a problem. And this is a real, I'm, I'm talking real. I've done this many times as a mistake, especially in construction. Like you see a problem coming and you're afraid you don't know how to fix it. So you ignore it mm-hmm. and you hope it will go away or you hope tomorrow you'll wake up with a solution. Yes. And I was driving home from an office and I see there's a problem at the distribution center. People are overworked. They feel... Mm-hmm. You know, like that it's late and it's not my fault. It's not their fault. It's just the business grew, grew too quick. And I thought like, okay, oh, like they're right about 70% of the email. They're wrong about 30% of it. Should I reply to the wrong? Should I reply to the right? Mm-hmm. I made a U-turn. I drove all the way back and I faced mm-hmm. the issue face to face. And I'm yeah. telling you like that is the number one mitigant of explosion. Mm-hmm. I mean, face problems when they come up otherwise they add up it's like not answering emails you know if you don't answer 20 emails every day you have 100 emails by friday you're not going to have a good saturday sunday because your head is thinking there's 100 emails i didn't reply to so you know it was interesting i I spent that night hugging the employees who were at the distribution center talking to them only talking about the things they were right about the things they were wrong about i left them for another day i reassured them about the points they were talking about I bought them dinner. I mean, I did what I had to do. I drove them home one by one. It took me an hour and a half. I got home at midnight. Um, But, you know, this was me driving home in a potential state of depression or anxiety, or you can name all the medical things. I don't like to even label them (laughs) because then you yourself. All these problems could have exploded in my mind over a few days. And I just thought, if you don't target the issues, you don't fix them. You just, you just grow them out. And I feel, yeah, if, if I'm qualified to give one advice, it's that one. It's don't let the issues grow bigger. Fight them. They're not going to fix themselves. Um, okay. If somebody's angry or anxious at you or they feel underrated or underappreciated, take a moment to really just 
target that conversation. Um, it will give you mental health. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. And it's not, I don't think it's just for entrepreneurship, it's in life as well, right? Um, I think this transcends our day to day, um, you know, regular lives. And um, well appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, this podcast is about emerging markets, uh, time for emerging markets, doors within emerging markets, amazing people like you doing some extraordinary work uh, uh, on a continent like Africa. You know, but, you know, we have listeners from Peru, um, Taiwan, you know, and Vietnam, and they're all uh, curious or they are thinking about how can they be of, uh, how can they be players to within this, uh, within this market? So, Based on your experience, your diverse experience, I, I would say, uh, I, I, uh, what, what has, what would someone, can you give us an idea of something that people should know before they get into a market like Namibia? What should they prepare for? Uh, what should they anticipate? Um, and how should they position themselves, hopefully, to be successful? Yeah, I, are you asking from a lens of entrepreneurship, like somebody who wants to come and, and do entrepreneurship in, in Southern Africa or a country that is similar? Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. When I worked at a bank, um, interviewing for private equity, mm -hmm. and um, I was traveling for all my block leaves to the African continent. Mm -hmm. I went to Nigeria, I went to Angola, I went to Ethiopia, I went to South Africa. Maybe, uh, and I was trying to find out what do people do and what could I do? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, travel is number one. If you don't know what, if you, I was doing financial modeling at Credit Suisse. I mean, I was an investment banking analyst. Yes. I, I thought I was a really smart guy with great ideas until I, until I got to the bank. I mean, mm -hmm. there's two things that happened to me there. One is your ideas were not welcome. And, mm -hmm. and, and the second one was everyone because they all had better financial modeling experience or they were quicker in Excel. So I had to hustle, man. I had to like really try to figure out how to do my job. Yeah. And um, over time, Sorry, I what, what, what was the second thing in the bank? Everyone, I missed that out. Yeah, yeah, what, what was it? The first, I think you said the first one, Claire, the second one I missed, I missed what you said about banks. Yeah, so like the, the, the first one that I said at the bank is that yeah. like, my ideas were not always welcome. Yes, you know? exactly. And, and the second one is that I also felt like everyone, I thought I was a really smart guy, yeah. but when I got there, like everyone was extremely smart and I considered <laughs> them all smarter than me at what we were doing. You know, maybe yes. I spoke better languages or, you know, whatever the story was. And I was so fortunate. I did SEO and MLT, which are two programs in, in the United States that help with this stuff. But, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, man, like, what I, what I realized also was that I needed to find out what was my skill set outside of the skill set I was building in banking. Like I went to banking and, and as, as the years went by, I became really good at what I was doing and very appreciated. And I was fortunate enough to move to Chile with the bank and help open the office there and a lot of really great experiences. But traveling to Nigeria, to Angola, to Namibia, to South Africa taught me one thing, especially in Nigeria, is that my voice counted. And you have to find a place where your voice counts to go do something. Because if you're confident about who you are and what you bring to the table, you can be confident about whatever you built around that premise. Yeah. And th the last thing is when I traveled to all these places, something I did, which I really recommend to anyone starting a business was you land in a country, you go to an accounting firm, forget all these, I'm going to introduce you to the mayor of Yaoundé <laughs> and the top uh, businessman of Douala and my uncle who has land. I mean, by the, this is, you know, whoever's listening and, and takes this advice, I'm going to sound, at, at the expense of sounding arrogant, I'm going to say this advice costs money, <laughs> you know? Please share. You will, you will <laughs> waste your time meeting with all these personalities if, I mean, that's great because you get a good feel for the market. If you don't do the following three to four things, the first one is meet with an accounting firm or two and really ask them about all the accounting policies in the government. What are the tax rates? How do you start a corporation? Uh, how often can you claim on your value added tax? What are some of the incentives out there? What are the budget announcements from a government perspective? Ask, ask, ask. And the best place to do that is with the, some of the top accounting firms. 
and tell them, I'm an investor, I'm coming to this country, I'm gonna hire you as an accountant, and this is my interview to find out if I like you. So they will all open their doors and you will learn more in 20 minutes than you will learn anywhere on the internet. Number two is go see a lawyer, a corporate lawyer or two, and tell them, I want to register a company. How long does it take? What do you feel? How is the government? Have they paid their debts? You know, also ask them, what is the land? If you're in the development business, like I was at the very beginning, what is the land titling rules? Can you own property in this country? How does that work? I mean, go into so much detail about legal things. The third one is walk into the municipality for an hour of the city where you want to do business. Mm -hmm. Look at people. How do they dress? How do they pay their bills? How does it work? Number four, which I learned from my father was walk into a supermarket and honestly just take photos of everything you would have bought if you lived there. Mm -hmm. And when you get home, compare them. How much is toothpaste? How much is milk? How much is bread? How much is a uh, pill for your headache. I mean, really get an idea for what is that economy. And the fifth one is walk into businesses, sit with taxi drivers, talk to people who run restaurants and find out how much are people getting paid. Straight up, ask someone in their face, what is your salary? How mm -hmm. much do you make? And compare the living standard of what the supermarket cost is to what people are making. When I was in Cameroon, this was a shock to me. How can people making what they make at the supermarket and at a restaurant and in a construction site afford what I would have bought at the supermarket? And the answer was impossible. When I went to Rwanda, which is a country that everyone is claiming is booming and boosting. I mean, taxi drivers make less than a US dollar to drive you anywhere. Even motorcycle drivers, people in construction sites make a fifth of what they make in Namibia and food is more expensive in Rwanda. So walk me through it. How do I build a company here with people who can support their lifestyle? So, I mean, if you can target these five things, your trip is paid for. And yep. not only is your trip paid for, but you're a, bit, you're a better businessman and a better investor and a better everything for that. You know? Forget all the other meetings. Those are just cherry on the cake. You know? yep. yep, definitely. I mean, th those five, um, that they're just incredible. <laughs> That's five incredible. And I think it's parts like I'm telling you, it's years of doing the same thing that I figured <laughs> out like what am I getting out of these meetings talking to the mayor or to some director? I mean, I need to figure out the rules before I know how to operate. Definitely. No, no, David, I would love to have you again on the on this podcast to share <laughs> more of your experiences and maybe very specifically, you know, in, in a construction business and just to get people's skills and all that. I think there's a lot to learn from you. Um, uh, uh, I think just uh, for people who want to either invest in what you're doing or, you know, want to work with you in Namibia or beyond, how can they reach you at this point in time? Well, hopefully my name will be on the episode. So you will be. <laughs> feel free to reach out. Yeah. Feel free to reach out on, on LinkedIn. Uh, um, my email is david at gojabu.com, G-O-J-A-B-U.com. Yes. Um, we are hiring anyone who is at their MBA or who is graduating or who has a job somewhere. If you live in the region, in the continent, or even in the States or in Europe, anywhere, you name it, and you feel like what I've shared is something interesting, please reach out, even if it's to share some ideas or feedback. Um, the, the number one is about building, building things with people that think like you. So if you're, if you're one of those people and you think that you would enjoy being part of this journey, like our doors are open for an internship or for a job. And the second one is, I mean, we're currently raising capital. Um, anyone who, who is in the VC world, who is an angel investor, who thinks that they have a specific interest in this field and they want to learn more, surely they can, they can reach out to you or to me and, and let you know or me know, I would appreciate that. And we can share our deck, we can spend some time on a call and um, yeah, it's hopefully we'll, we'll be moving quick on this round. So yeah, if, yeah. if somebody actually reaches out, it, uh, I've committed my time over the next few weeks. And thank you so much, David, for being on the pod. Uh, all the contacts will be will be on the uh, the below the description of this podcast, and we have it on Spotify, Google uh, Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, as well as on the YouTube link that I'm gonna share with the video. So. Uh, David, I would love to have you again uh, in the future. And I think there's so much insights you have that people listening to this podcast would really love to learn more from you. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the energy. I it's feel inspired. And, and, and let, let's have a call about the Cameroon. Let's, like, it doesn't have to be a podcast. I, I want to hear more.
maybe you should interview your solo <laughs> podcast about Cameroon. I would love to listen to it. Sure do, sure do. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Wonderful. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Yeah, see you guys in the next episode.